Welcome to Living Word Ministries with our director and Bible teacher, Debbie Blank. Debbie's passion is for you to understand and apply God's truths to your life. Now let's listen and enjoy teaching from the Word of God with Debbie Blank. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful for stories like we've read about Billy Graham and how he came to really believe and solidly make the commitment that your word is the word of God, inspired and God breathes so that we can believe everything that's in it. And because of that, we can learn about you. We can learn how you, who you are and what you call us to do and how you call us to live and what we can do for the kingdom of God. I pray that you will open our eyes and our hearts tonight as we talk about Jesus Christ, as we talk about redemption, as we discuss the most important truths in Scripture, and that's how we can have a relationship with you. Prepare our hearts, God, for this discussion. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. By the way, I'll go back and say, unless you've already read a book on Billy Graham or some such a hero of the faith, it's really awesome because it's very humbling. Just when you think that you're doing what God wants you to do, you read a book about a humble person who really did what God wants them to do, and you get knocked down a couple notches and realize, am I really doing what God wants me to do, or am I doing what I want to do? It's been a very humbling book for me to read. All right, let's move on. We're going to begin with our review. We've already talked about it through the story of Billy Graham, and now we're going to read about it here. The Bible is God's word and the plumb line for all truth. If you don't believe that, then you have no reason to come back to this class because this is where we find all of our truths. This is where we get all the information that we share. It's from the Bible. I, in my teachings, share a lot of things that are going on in the world, comparing with Bible prophecy and things, but it's the Bible that gives us the truth, and that's what we always need to focus on. And then from the Bible, we learn that there is only one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. But our God, as one God, is a triune God. He reveals himself and his love in three persons with three distinct responsibilities. You might say, uh, here it says distinct roles, yet unified in being. They are all 100% God. They just have different roles. Now that's what sets us as Christians apart from every other world religion. Because other world religions will tell us we believe in multiple gods. We don't. How we can have one God and three persons, that comes by faith. But it's clear from the scriptures that God, the Father, is God. Jesus is God. The Holy Spirit is God. We've been through two of those, God, the Father, and Jesus. We'll hit the Holy Spirit next week and understand why he's God, to understand this, to completely go through it. Then we talked about God, the Father, Abba, Father. He's present and active in his creation, at creation, but he's also separate. He is seated on the throne, exalted. We have um, Jesus Christ. Last week, we talked about him, only to the point that we were able to discuss him being 100% fully God and 100% fully man. So we have laid that foundation. Just uh, before we move on, though, I've got to say, do you have any questions about that? Because it's, how can somebody be 100% and 100%? I mean, that, that's 200%. You can't be 200%. Yeah, you'd have two people, but Jesus is one. He's one person, but he's 100% God. He never, he emptied himself and took on the form of a bondservant, but he didn't cease being God. And he became human so that he could die, suffer and die for our sins, but he didn't sin because he's God. That comes by faith. It only comes by faith, because otherwise it's impossible to understand. And it comes from believing the Bible. Because we went through all the verses that showed he's God, and we went through all the verses that showed he, not all, but a, enough to get the point to show that he's man. So the rest we just have to take with faith. The word of God says it, I believe it, that settles it for me. I may not understand it, but that's okay. It's not important that I understand. God says that his ways are higher than our ways. What's important is that I believe in God. Man cannot completely understand God and his ways. That's why Deuteronomy 29, 29 says the secret things belong to the Lord. So we ended last time with Jesus Christ, fully God and fully man. That's where we're going to continue 
tonight is to talk about Jesus Christ. But before we do, before we get into what he did here on earth, we want to talk about what other people believe about Jesus. The Muslims believe that Jesus was born of a virgin. They believe that Jesus is one of their great prophets. They do not believe that he died for the sins of mankind. They don't believe that he was resurrected. They do not believe, they do believe he's coming again. They don't believe that he redeemed mankind of their sin because he didn't die and he wasn't resurrected and nobody else can atone for mankind's sin. That's what they believe. So Jesus could not have done it. This is what I was looking for. Uh, I have a brochure here right now. Oh, they don't believe he was God. They don't believe he's sinless. Uh, I have a brochure, a Muslim brochure right here, and it talks about, um, let's see, the biggest sin is associating partners with God. God does not forgive association with him, but he forgives what is less than that for whom he wills. And he who associates others with God has certainly gone astray. People, when we say Jesus is God, what they're saying is we're associating Jesus with God, which makes two gods, and that can't be. So they do not agree with the gospel message. They don't believe with who, in who Jesus is. They go on to say associating partners with God includes taking someone, whether it be humans, idols, or any creation, as a God, along with God himself. What happens a lot of times, though, when you talk to a Muslim is they'll focus on what we do agree on. The virgin birth, the fact that Jesus is going to come again. Uh, they'll focus on those things because they do believe those. But they don't believe the gospel message. Then you have, and we, we f always talk about the first three religions besides Christianity because Muslim, Buddhism, and Hinduism compri and Christianity comprise 85% of, of people in the world, the religions in the world. Hindus believe Jesus is a teacher but not God. His death did not atone for sins and he didn't rise from the dead. So obviously they don't believe in the gospel message. Buddhists, Jesus is considered an enlightened man but he's really not part of their beliefs. Jews, of course, rejected Jesus as the Messiah. They don't believe he's God and that he didn't rise from the dead to save us from our sins because they don't recognize him as God. Now, the Mormons are probably the more interesting along with the Muslims because the Mormons believe that Jesus says separate from God created by a union of the Father and the Mother of Heaven and that his brother is Satan his death doesn't provide full atonement, but his resurrection does provide resurrection for everyone. Now, does that match up with the gospel message? But the Mormons will call themselves a Christian religion. Are they? They cannot be a Christian religion. Nobody be, can be a Christian religion unless you believe in this book, the Bible, and not an interpretation of the book, not another book that goes along with it, but the Bible. Jehovah's Witnesses. Jesus is not God. He was Michael before he lived on earth. He lived a perfect life on earth. He died on a stake and was resurrected as a spirit, but his body was destroyed. Hmm. Is that true? No, because when Jesus, he was resurrected in a transformed body, but he ate. He ate with his disciples up in the Galilee. Uh, so he has to have some kind of a body, not a spirit. But anyway, it, it's important to understand what others believe to see that we don't all agree on the same things. When you get into a discussion with the whole Jehovah's Witness and a Mormon, and they are wonderful people. Don't misunderstand me. As people, they're great, at least the ones I've met and I know, but we don't believe in the same thing, and that's what we have to not be misled on. New Age, Jesus is not God or Savior or resurrected, but is an... Amended master. Okay, he's an amended master. Yeah, you're right. Um, he said there's a lot of difference in denominations on what we believe. Let's take, for example, the virgin birth. 19% of Lutheran pastors in America believe in, excuse me, 19% uh, of Lutheran pastors in the United States do not believe in the virgin birth. So that means 81% do. And every denomination is a little different until you get to the, uh, as you go down the list, the highest number are Methodists. 60% of Methodist pastors do not believe in the virgin birth. So if they don't believe the tenets of Christianity, they can't teach them. And if they take that out of Scripture that is clear in the Old Testament and the New Testament, then they're taking other things out of Scripture too. 
not just Methodists, but all religions. So you really have to be careful because our, our Christian denominations have watered down Scripture. It's just like Chuck Templeton trying to tell Billy Graham you know, 60 years ago that a lot of the mainline fundamentalists were turning away from the Word of God as inspired. That was 65, 65 years ago. That was then. It's still happening now. So Christian denominations will probably tell you as a denomination that they believe in the tenets of scriptures, but a lot of their pastors don't. So you've got to be careful. There's an awful lot of non-Christian views out there. We've got to be careful. When we have somebody show up at our door and we let them in and they, they speak very well and they talk about our common bond and they show great love, it's easy to be drawn into that. But don't be. You have to know the truth because that truth will set you free. So now we're going to go into the question, why did Jesus become man? Why would he leave the comfort of heaven to become man? And I say that tongue-in-cheek because Jesus is everywhere. Okay, so we could be resurrected and go back to heaven with him. Great. Any other comments? Any other thoughts about why Jesus became man? Right, to be an example to us as to how we ought to live. Mm -hmm. Spoke the word. And he was different than other teachings were. You can read the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and see that Lou first. Okay, he also came to fulfill prophecy, to make all of Scripture true by his, his answering and fulfilling prophecies that we're going to talk about tonight. The main reason that Jesus came was to save us from our sins. So we have to go back and see that man needed redemption. Man needed Jesus to come to save us from our sins. So let's start with creation. I wasn't going to read this because you all know it. But you know what? Sometimes I think we all know it so we don't read it. And I think it's important. I, 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 my guess is that uh, the first several chapters of Matthew and the first, or maybe even the book, and the first several chapters of Genesis or maybe the book are what people read the most. Because we say, I'm going to read the Bible. So we start with Genesis. And we get through Genesis and maybe Exodus and then we quit when we get to Leviticus. Or we might start with Matthew and then by the time we get to Mark, it's, Mark is almost like 95% repetitive of Matthew Lu and Luke. So we say, oh, this is getting old, and we stop. But I still want to read the creation story, at least to talk about it a little bit, to show God's love for us. Because God doesn't need us. At the time of the creation, there were angels. How do we know angels were in existence at the time of creation? Well, who was in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve? Satan, and Satan was an angel. So angels were in existence before mankind was in existence, or at least at the same time. We have the days of creation, and I'm just going to run through them in Genesis 1. And starting with verse 3, it says, God said, let there be light. And he separated the light from the darkness. Now, this isn't the sun, the moon, and the stars. That'll come later. But the earth, it says in verse 2, was formless and void and dark. So God had to bring light into the world. And it was, he said it was evening and it was morning, day one. You ever wonder why Jews celebrate their days in the evening before? You know, Jews, Jews start their day at sunset the day before. So on Monday, their Monday starts Sunday night. This is because of creation. God said there was evening and there was morning on day one. And then he said, let there be the expanse of the heavens. In verse 7, God made the expanse and separated the waters which were below the expanse and the waters which were above the expanse. So apparently everything was water. And he put this, you know, great big huge line right in the middle of the water. So you had water below and water above. How do you think the world was destroyed by flood under Noah? Did it happen because it rained for 40 days? I don't think so. How do you get all the mountains covered by rain for 40 days? It's because God raises up the water that was below the expanse and he took all the water that was above the expanse and he brought them into a torrential downpour and uppour at the same time. That's how we have the flood. So God did that. The, the third day, it says, uh, he made dry land in verse 9. Verse 14 of Genesis 1, it says, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the days from the nights and let, there be, let them be for signs and seasons and days and years. Now, we use them for seasons and days and years. Most, gen most people until modern society 
has determined the days of the year by the lunar system, the lunar calendar. That's what the Jews do. Now we have 28 days and 31 days and 30 days, and it changes. But did you notice that God uses the sun and the moon and the stars as signs? So uh, that's we talk a lot about that. When he's talking about the blood moon before Jesus returned, the blood moons, when he talks about the signs in the skies, it's because he puts them up there also for signs for us. And I'm not just talking about zodiac signs so that we can have our horoscope. Heaven forbid about that. I'm talking about signs for things that God's going to do. He uses the heavenlies for that. Then we go on into day five in verse 20. He said, let the water team with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth. And he talks about great sea monsters and all of them. Do you know the only thing? I don't know. Wait a minute. Forget that thought. I don't want to say that. Okay. Let's move on to number six, day six. And it starts in verse 24, but 25 is where I'm going to begin. And God made the beasts of the earth after their kind and the cattle and the creepy things in the ground. God saw that it was good. Verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over the earth and over the creepy things. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So what do you see in those two verses about creation? The creation of man. Okay. We make them in our image or our likeness. But God's only one. So how can it say our? He's talking about the Trinity. Because as we talked about weeks ago, God the Father, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit were all there at creation. Genesis 1 and 2 say that for God and the Holy Spirit. And then John 1 through 4, John 1, 1 through 4, says that about Jesus. So they were all there at creation. So let us make man in our image is one of the signs in Scripture for the Trinity. Uh, what else do you learn from these verses? Well, what does it mean to be made in the image of God? I mean, he's ma if we're made in the image of God, and yet we're male and female, are male and female the same body types? So who is God? Is he a, a combination of men and women together? Is that what it means? He made man first. That's correct. We learn that later. What does it mean to be made in the image of God? Spirit. Spirit. God is spirit, and we worship him in spirit and truth. So God doesn't have hands and arms and legs and eyes and ears. The Bible indicates he does when it says God hears or God sees. But God is spirit. The authors are using, as I've told you before, anthropomorphisms, which are just words that are used to identify God with us so we can understand what it means that God hears us or God sees us. So we are made in his image. We are spirit. And then, actually, we see it a little bit later, but it says it here. God gave them a responsibility. He didn't just put them on the earth and say, eat bonbons for the rest of your life. He actually gave them a responsibility. Let them rule over all these things that God has created. So he put man in charge because man's the only thing he made in his image. Now think about that. When you think of evolution, <laughs> how could evolution be true? Because all these other things were made by God, but man's the only thing made in God's image. And he told man to rule over them. That's impossible to do if you are part of them in evolution. So that's creation in, its, in a nutshell of how God created man. Perfect. It goes on in chapter 2 where God said to um, Adam in verse 15, The Lord took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. So he gave him another job to take care of the garden. Fascinating. Let's look and see what God said for Eve. In verse 18, the Lord said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a what? Helper suitable for him. Verse 20, And the man gave names to all the cattle and the birds, but for Adam there was not found a helper suitable for him. So the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept, and then took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. So he made man to rule over things. 
He made women or wives to be helpmates to their husbands. Are we doing that in this society? We've, we've lost a lot of that because we women want equal rights, equal abilities, equal opportunities, equal work, equal pay, all those things we are striving for rather than our number one calling by God, which is to be a helper for our husbands. Now, that doesn't mean you cannot work outside the home. You read the Proverbs 31 woman. This gal had owned property. She was in charge of her maids. She did a lot of amazing things. So I'm not saying you cannot work outside the home. But I'm saying, women, that our number one priority in God's eyes is to be a helper suitable for our husbands. Now, guys, don't go over and hit, hit them over the head with that when you get home today. That's something for women to do. You guys, you guys have the biggest responsibility, and according to Ephesians 5, 22 to, to 34, I think it is, and that is you need to love your wives as Christ loved the church. Now, that is a tall order. So, you know, don't think you get away easy with that. <laughs> All right, so that's men and women. That's how God created man and woman, and he created man to have a job because man needs something to do. Women automatically have something to do because we bear children and we take care of the family. But men needed a job. Well, then we get to chapter 3, and what happens in chapter 3 is what? Sin enters the world. Let's read verse 1. The serpent was more crafty than any beast in the field which the Lord had made. And God said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden? Oops, let me go back to chapter 2 because I forgot to read that. It says in verse 16, The Lord commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may freely eat, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat thereof you shall surely die. So God said, everything is yours except one tree. And Satan comes in. And does he go to Adam, by the way? Who does he go to? He goes to the woman. Why? Why do you suppose he went to the woman? I mean, we don't know. Scripture doesn't tell us. But why do you think he went to the woman? I'm going to use a different word. She's more emotional. Women are more emotional, more right-brained. And so things that we see appeal to us. Whereas guys are more left brain, and, you know, God said this, so this is what I'm going to do. Well, she may know, well, she, I'm sure she does know what God says, but she's also more, you know, she sees something and it looks good. Just look at our visas when we go shopping. We see things and they look good. So he tempts her and he says, Did, uh, Indeed, as God said, you shall not eat of the tree of the garden. And she goes, oh, no, 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 that's not what he said. But um, we can eat from anything but from the tree of the not from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Oh, we can't eat from that. And she added to it. She says at the end of verse 3, we can't even touch it lest you die. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I think Satan said that. And the woman said to the serpent, from the, yeah. yeah. She said we shouldn't even touch it lest you die. So the serpent comes back and he says, oh, you're not going to die. Well, how does she know? Has she ever seen death? Does she understand what death is? No. A lot of times when we don't know something or understand it, haven't seen it, we just kind of ignore it. He gives a half-truth because she's not going to die physically right now, but she will later. And she's going to also die what other way? Spiritually. So when the Bible talks about a second death, keep in mind, that sec the first death is spiritual, the second death is physical when we get to uh, the New Testament. He goes on in verse 5, says, For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open, and you're going to be like God, knowing good and evil. Well, there again, you get the woman's more emotional side and think, well, that'd be kind of neat to be like God and understand all this. I mean, I, I kind of would think that. And obviously we weren't there, and we don't know what it's like. But uh, one thing I do know in life is we take things for granted, don't we? We take our families for granted. We take our jobs for granted, our money for granted, until it's not there anymore. And she probably was taking everything for granted because that's all she knew. I mean, I'm guessing, but I could see that happening. Woman, the, verse 6, when the woman saw that the tree was good for fruit, for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, there's that looking, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took it and ate it and gave it to her husband with her, and he ate. Hmm. Gave it to her husband with her. So was Satan tempting Eve and Adam was standing there watching the whole thing? 
Or was he just maybe with her, but over there a little bit while Satan was tempting her? Don't know, but he was with her. Then, verse 7, the eyes of both of them were opened. They knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves and made themselves loin coverings. Sin was now into the world, and there's nothing they could do to take it back. I'm really spoiled because I do a lot of my research and work and study on the Internet. And when I was writing my book recently, I made a mistake. I just went up here and said, undo the mistake. And so I think about that a lot when something happens, and I think, oh, I just want to go undo it. I'm sure they wanted to undo this, but they couldn't. It was done. So the Lord was walking in the garden, and they hid themselves. Let's look and see if there's any repentance here. It says that God came in the garden. They hid themselves from God. And when God said, where are you? Adam said in verse 10, I heard the sound of you in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid myself. And God said, who told you you were naked? And the man said, verse 12, well, the woman did it. It's her fault. The woman you gave me did it is what he said. It's her fault. So when people blame other people or when you blame everybody, that's the first thing that we do as sinners is we don't take personal responsibility. We blame somebody else. Now, was it true? Yes, the woman sinned and gave it to Adam. Yes, it's true, but he's blaming her. Well, so the Lord said to Eve in verse 13, what is it that you've done? And Eve said, the serpent deceived me. She blames, and I ate. So immediately they start in the sin nature of blaming other people instead of taking personal responsibility. The moment sin came into the world, God said there must be a consequence for this sin, the penalty for sin. We've read some of it there right then in the Garden of Eden. But let's read what God says in Genesis 3 to the serpent. It's starting in verse 14. The Lord said to the serpent, Because you've done this, cursed are you more than any cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly shall you go, and dust shall you eat all the days of your life. Okay, well, we know snakes do that. Uh, But this is it, verse 15. This is the most crucial verse in Scripture. And because it says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. So there is going to be constant friction between Satan and mankind. Forever, there's going to be friction. When he says between you and the woman and your seed and her seed, he's talking about the people that will come on the face of the earth when he's talking about the woman rather than Adam. She is the bearer of children. So from now on, Satan is going to be doing everything he can to destroy man, and he's already got his foot in the door. But when he says that this enmity is going to be between your seed and her seed, does a woman have a seed? No. What does a woman have in her body? An egg. The seed comes from man. The egg comes from woman. So when he's talking about the woman's seed, we know uh, way back in Galatians chapter 3, and and now it's talking here about Abraham, when Abraham talks about descendants and seeds. But what it tells us is the seed is Christ. In Galatians 3, 16... The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seeds. This is much later on, but we can refer that idea back to to the Garden of Eden in the seed. And when he says, and to seeds is referring to many, but rather to one and to your seed, that is the Christ. So we have a prophecy right here in Genesis 3, excuse me, 15, that God is going to send a, a Messiah born of a virgin into the world and when he comes he says he shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel well bruise here means crush jesus is going to crush satan but in the process of doing that satan's going to bruise him on the heel or crush his heel well what i'm told and maybe you know better than this i've never asked you as a nurse but i'm told that crucifixion is the only means of death where it bruises the heel. Does that, I don't know if that's true or not, but that's, that's what I've been told. So you're not only having the prophesying of the Messiah here and that the virgin birth is going to happen, 
but you're having a prophesying of how Jesus is going to eventually crush Satan, but it's not going to happen until Jesus is broken. He's crucified on a cross. So you have here the very first time, right after sin comes into the world, God doesn't waste any time. He promises them a redeemer, a Messiah. Do they know it's going to be God? Does this text tell us? No, it's this text doesn't tell us that. They don't completely understand it. But they do know what God is saying. You know why I know they know what God is saying? Because in chapter 4, verse 1, Now the man had relations with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain, and said, I have begotten a man-child with the help of the Lord. What that means in the Hebrew is, I have begotten a man-child, and this may be the Redeemer that was promised. So she thought that this man-child that she had was going to be the Redeemer that was promised in Genesis 3, 15. We don't know how many years from the time that God promised that until Cain was born, but we do know that that's what Eve meant when she said that. So she knew. They knew what God had promised back in G Genesis 3, 15. And they were looking from a, for a Redeemer from the time of Eve forward. Did you know that? Isn't that pretty neat of God? Not to leave man in their sin, but to give them a way of escape from the very beginning. A promise of a way of escape from the very beginning. So that is the provision for sin. And we know that that is Jesus Christ. So we'll get to that in a minute. But the perfect sacrifice was illustrated to them in Exodus 12. Exodus 12 gives them their first example of the perfect sacrifice in a feast called... Anybody know what this is? Passover. At the Feast of Passover, it tells us in Genesis 12, starting, well, I'm not going to start at the beginning, but it says in verse 5, verse 4, you're gonna, your household is, is to get a lamb. And then in verse 5, it says, Your lamb shall be an unblemished male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Obviously, Jesus wasn't a year old, but he was an unblemished lamb, and he represented the Passover. The Passover represented him, I should say, because in verse 13 it says, And the blood from this goat, after you've eaten it, or the sheep, the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live, in verse 13. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day will be a memorial to you, and you shall celebrate it as a feast, as a permanent ordinance. It, it is exactly the Passover celebration, but as, as Lou was saying also, the way they put the blood on the lentils and on the doorposts, and then the basin below is a great example of the cross and crucifixion. And the fact that the blood saved them from death in the Passover <coughs> is an example of Jesus saving us. So he now is the perfect sacrifice that's explained to them, to the Jews, at Passover, during Passover, for Passover. And then if you look at... Uh, 2 Corinthians, Corinthians 5, 7 it says, Jesus is our Passover lamb. Jesus is the one whose blood paid the penalty so that mankind wouldn't die. Let me see if that's the right verse for you. Um, it is 1 Corinthians 5, 7. It says Christ is our Passover lamb. So we have so many places throughout Scripture that prophesied the Messiah, and this is one of them. We'll talk about that in a, a little bit more. But there, this sacrifice that would happen, according to Genesis 3.15, would be the perfect sacrifice. And then fast forward to Luke 24.27. Jesus is on the road to Emmaus with a couple of guys, and they don't understand what's going on. So Jesus says to them, he goes, starts from the beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, and he explained to them the things concerning himself in all scripture. See, the Jews didn't accept Jesus as the Redeemer because they didn't understand. They didn't have access to a Bible, so they had to listen to the teachings of the rabbis. And the rabbis clearly had a different view of the teachings. For example, Isaiah has four chapters in it from chapter 42 to 53. Four of those chapters deal with the suffering servant Messiah. But instead of seeing that, what they saw was this deals either with Israel as a suffering country or it deals with Isaiah as a suffering person instead of seeing it as the Messiah. So they missed those things. But Jesus told the people on the road to Emmaus 
what some of those prophecies were. So I just picked a few of those prophecies of the Redeemer. I mean, there's 15 here, uh, but I've got this wonderful little book that I carry with me all the time. I don't even know if you can get any more. The Bible Prophecy Miracles. And so whenever I want a quick fix, instead of going into Scripture directly, I just look up the Scriptures from here. Or the, there's just dozens and dozens of prophecies of Jesus' first coming. And I, I haven't even looked, but there's, I'm sure, prophecies of his second coming in there too. And these are just a few of them. All nations will be blessed through the Jews. And by the way, how do we know? Because all of these have Old Testament verses with them, I think. Yes, they all do. So how do we know that Jesus is the one who fulfilled these and that these are actually messianic prophecies? Because they're reiterated in the New Testament. They're either directly quoted in the New Testament, which most of them are, or what happened in the New Testament validates what was prophesied in the Old. And these, I think, are all mentioned. All nations will be blessed through the Jews. We see that in Romans 11. The Messiah will be God. Uh, wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. But it starts out talking about him as a son. And we know uh, Matthew 1.23, Emmanuel, God with us. No bone of Christ would be broken. Exodus 12, just like the Passover lamb. We know that on the cross, no bone was broken. Uh, snake lifted in the serpent is a model of Christ. You remember in the serpent in the wilderness when the, um, the snakes were killing all the people? And God had Moses hold up a Nehushtan, it's called. That's a little bit of trivia right there. The Bible calls it the Nehushtan. And whenever people looked on it, then they were healed. And do you know the Nehushtan is the shape of a cross? And then, Genesis, or then John, in the book of John, chapter 3, verses, um, I think, 12 through 14, talk about how Jesus is the fulfillment of that. The Messiah will be hung on a tree, redeeming us of the curse. Well, Christ was hung on a tree. Messiah will sit on the throne of David. That's a covenant promise of David's kingdom, coming th uh, the Messiah coming through David's lineage. The body of the Messiah will not undergo decay. He was raised from the dead. That's a prophecy from the Old Testament of the resurrection. It says the Messiah will suffer crucifixion, moxing, mocking, casting of lots. Well, you could read Psalm 22 about that. Actually, Psalm 2, Psalm 16, Psalm 22, and then a bunch of other Psalms deal with prophecies of the Messiah. And again, how do we know? Because that was one of my first questions in a Bible study 37 years ago, was how do we know that these Psalms really point to the Messiah? It's because the New Testament quotes them as relating to Jesus and he quotes from the Old Testament. The Messiah will be born of a virgin. We've talked about that. Messiah is going to perform miracles, save them, uh, heal the blind, the deaf, the lame. Isaiah 34 says that, but so does Isaiah 61. Jesus quoted that in the little synagogue in Nazareth. Uh, servant Messiah, I just mentioned the servant prophecies um, in Isaiah, four different chapters. Uh, actually, part of chapter 52 also. The Messiah be called out of Egypt. We saw that in Matthew. Uh, you have Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. Messiah will enter Jerusalem riding on a donkey. Messiah will be betrayed with 30 pieces of silver. I don't even take you to those New Testament verses because you all know the stories. Those are just 15 prophecies. You can imagine how many others Jesus walked through. He could have walked through uh, the Passover lamb and explaining that. He could have walked through the tabernacle, explaining how Jesus is the I am of each article in the tabernacle. When the tabernacle was made, it was made in a replication of who Jesus Christ would be. He could have walked through any of these Old Testament prophecies. We don't know. But there's, as I say, dozens and dozens and dozens of them. I mean, 70, 80, 100, lots and lots of prophecies about Jesus Christ fulfilling these prophecies. Now, I, I got to tell you, there's a, um, uh, uh, there's a book that I read that said that if you take just 12 basic prophecies, like he was born in Bethlehem, he'd come riding in an, on a donkey, He'd be of the lineage of David, that kind of thing. And you, you just take 12 of them. gives you an idea of the percentage. It's like me taking this ring, flying over the entire world, and dropping it in the ocean, and then saying, go find it. That would be the percentage of one person trying to manipulate just a dozen of these prophecies to be fulfilled. I mean, there are things in life we can manipulate, but you can't manipulate one person meeting these dozens of prophecies. Only God can do that. Oh, good point. Good point. People, the soldiers wanted the garment of Christ, which was not ripped in two. 
uh, because it was his prayer shawl, but they wanted it because Jesus had been going from town to town healing people so that people would even heal by touching it. And they wanted that magic. I'd never thought about that before. That's probably very true. What he was saying, though, from Psalm 22 is, that's what says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which Jesus quoted when he was lying on the cross. Not lying, but on the cross. So there's just oodles of prophecies. Jesus fulfilled them all. Nobody could do that unless he's God. Unless God had told us in advance what was going to happen, and Jesus as God fulfilled every one of them. So we know Jesus is the fulfillment of the messianic prophecies because the New Testament confirms he fulfilled them. So Jesus fulfilled prophecies like we talked about. He died for the sins of mankind. That's, I mean, we just read a few of those, but there's lots more. He rose from the dead. That was prophesied in the scriptures. As a matter of fact, let's go to 1 Corinthians 15 because you have the gospel message there in just a few verses. Matter of fact, 1 Corinthians 15 is the resurrection passage. So it also talks about the resurrection. But the gospel message in 1 Corinthians 15, 1, Paul says, I make known to you, brethren, the gospel. Okay, the good news, which I preached to you, which you received and which also you stand. So he's saying, okay, folks, this is the gospel message. Now let me tell you what it is, he says. And he doesn't say that, but that's what he's going on to reiterate. Verse 3, for I delivered to you when I delivered you the gospel as of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. So Christ died for our sins. He did it because the Bible said he was going to do it. It was prophesied that he would do it. That's what it means by according to the scriptures. He fulfilled the scriptures. And he was buried. So it wasn't just a seeming death, and then all of a sudden he was alive. He was buried. And he was buried for at least 36 hours because he was buried during the Sabbath. They couldn't get to him until Sunday morning. Do you remember what it was like when, they ra when he raised Lazarus from the dead? Do you remember what the sisters said or somebody said? But my Lord, if you roll away the tomb, it's going to smell <laughs> or stink or something like that. So it's the same thing with Jesus. He's in the tomb. He's buried. And, and if you've got a question that he died, they stuck a spear in his side to prove that he was dead before they took him down. But that's one of the things. He had to die and have confirmation that he was dead. And then verse 4 says, and then he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. That's what the Bible says. And he will not undergo decay. And then it says he appeared to Cephas and then to the 12. And then after that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren. The Bible is clear throughout the Bible that you can only believe something if you have at least two or three witnesses. Well, Jesus didn't stop with two or 12. He went to 500 people that witnessed his resurrection, that witnessed that he was alive. Nobody witnessed his resurrection. But he had to be because Jesus could walk through walls, but he still could eat. Jesus could appear one place and then appear another. So there was definitely something different about Jesus. He wasn't the same as when he was alive. So Jesus rose from the dead on the third day in his resurrected body. He's the first fruits from the dead, 1 Corinthians 15, 23 tells us. What does that mean, the first fruits from the dead? He was the very first person to be resurrected. But wait a minute, what about Lazarus? What about the people that came to life after Jesus died and they came out of their tombs? What about the uh, um, boy and his mother from Nain? Who was, they were bringing him out of the city to bury him. Jesus brought him out. What about those people that were resurrected? They didn't go to heaven. So what happened to them? Okay. They, they died again is what happened. They were resurrected for a period of time. They were brought back to life by whomever brought them back to life. But they died again. Why? Because Jesus hadn't yet been resurrected. He's the first fruits. He had to be resurrected from the dead, and then he has to ascend to heaven in order for us to be able to do it too. That's why it says he's not only the first fruits, but in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, it goes on to say, verse 23, each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, and after that, those who are Christ's at his coming. So nobody could ever go to heaven or be resurrected until Christ was. That's what it means by the first fruits. 
Um, and then we can live forever with him now that we can be resurrected. Uh, it's, uh, he appeared to more than 500. He conquered death. Now, see, that's really important. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? According to those passages in 1 Corinthians. There's no more spiritual death because of him. And, I, you know, I, I've maybe told you this before, but I certainly told it to you earlier. From some of the testimonies I've heard of people who die, I believe that God takes our spirit seconds before our body dies so that we don't actually physically die. We, we are not here in our spirit when our body dies. Now, I don't have any proof of that in the scriptures. I just know from so many people's stories that that's what it sounds like happens. And wouldn't that be like God? Because why would we have any death, physical or spiritual, once we know him? Because he's conquered death. And then Christ ascended into heaven. When he ascended into heaven, do you know, do you remember what the angel said in Acts chapter 1? He said, why do you look on him who's ascended into heaven? He's going to come back in the same way. He says, men of Galilee, I'm in verse 11 of Acts 1. Why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus whom you've seen taken up from you in heaven will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. So he not only has gone into heaven where Hebrews 7.25 says he sits at the right hand of God to make intercession for us, but he's going to come again in that same way. Zechariah tells us he's coming again to the Mount of Olives, which is where he was ascended. And then Jesus is our high priest. Well, how can Jesus be a king and a high priest? The kingly line comes through Judah. The high priestly line comes from Levi of the 12 tribes of Israel. You cannot be both. You are one or the other. But Jesus is God. He can be both. And he is, and he's our high priest. He's seated at the right hand of God. He lives to make intercession for us before the Father. So he fulfilled all prophecy for the Messiah. We know if you believe the Bible, Jesus has answered everything in the Bible to prove that he was the redeemer of mankind that was promised in Genesis 3.15. Do you believe that? Your life depends on it. Your eternity depends on whether or not you believe that. The question would be, let's look at Jesus as our redeemer. We have to remember these aspects of his redemption. He gave himself voluntarily. People will say that the Jews killed him. Or the Romans killed them. But this passage in John, Jesus says, I laid down my life for you. He gave up his life. He came to earth to die. He gave up his life so that he could redeem us from our sins. In death on the cross, we know that from Philippians 2.8, we read a couple weeks ago. Uh, as foretold in scriptures, I think we've gone through that quite a bit. And then, as Lou was saying before, no, I guess Dwight, as the perfect sacrifice to pay the price for the penalty of sin. Let's, let's look at Hebrews for a minute. If you get a chance in the next few days, go read Hebrews 8, 9, and 10 because they're wonderful passages about the importance of what Christ did for us and his death and his propitiation and take, uh, satisfying the sins of mankind. But let's just look now at verses um, chapter 9. Uh, I'm not going to read all these verses. Uh, let's read verses, start with verse 11 of chapter 9. When Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of the creation, and not through the blood of bulls and goats and calves, but through his own blood he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Now that's a lot to take in, but if you understand the purpose of the Day of Atonement, if you understand the purpose of sacrifices, it was to split, it was to a sprinkle the blood on the altar, specifically the Holy of Holies, for the Day of Atonement. But even on other altars, or in Moses' case, he sprinkled it on the covenant that was made between God and people. That was a sign. The blood was a sign of redemption, specifically for the Day of Atonement. When they killed the goat, they actually took two goats or lambs, depending on how you look at it, and one, they laid the sins of the people on and sent it out into the wilderness. And the other one, they killed for the sacrifice of the sins of the people. And they sprinkled the blood in the mercy seat in the tabernacle, in the Holy of Holies. And do you know what the word for mercy seat 
is in the New Testament, it's the same word for propitiation, which means God's satisfaction. What does it mean, Bob? He's my propitiation man. What? And what does propitiation mean? That's right. Total satisfaction of God's wrath. It's a big word. It's in scripture a couple of times. Jesus is our propitiation is what it says. That's the satisfaction of God's wrath. But in the Old Testament, that means the sprinkling of the blood on the mercy seat. And that uh, P-R-O-P-I-T-I-A-T-I-O-N. Um, oh, actually, I can look up here. <laughs> yeah, it's right up there under number E. So, uh, so Jesus, it said, his own blood made eternal redemption for us. How long is eternal? Forever. Do they have to do Jesus' sacrifice every year to cover our blood, to cover our sins? No, they had to do the bulls and goats every year. But for us, it was once for all, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, the Bible says. In verse 13, For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through his eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, how much more will he cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? That's what Christ did for us in his eternal redemption. And then over in verse 22, it says, According to the law, one must also say, All things are cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. This whole passage in verses chapters 8, 9, and 10 of Hebrews talks about Christ as our high priest and what he did for us. And that includes the shedding of blood so that our sins would be covered. We would be redeemed. He's the substitution. He died in the place of sinners. And he reconciled us with God because he satisfied God's wrath over sin. Man, so that we could be saved. Christ is the only way to God the Father, salvation, and eternal life. John 14, 6. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, nobody comes to the Father except by me. It said that nobody could go to heaven before Christ. And that's true. If you read Luke chapter 16, you'll read the story in the Old Testament, because even though it's in the New Testament, Christ hasn't died yet, so it's Old Testament. You'll read the story of how people either went to Abraham's bosom when they died, or they went to the place of torment. So there were two temporary places, one for the people who had believed in the coming Messiah and one for the people who hadn't. Just like today, we have people who believe in the Messiah, but the difference is now that Christ has died and is the first fruits, we can go to heaven and be with him right away. Paul says in Philippians 1.25, to live is Christ, to die is gain, because he would be with Jesus right away. Or you have another place, and that's the people who don't believe in God. They go to a temporary place and they stay there until the end of time, end of time on earth of which they go through the great white throne judgment and are judged for their sins. But the Bible says in Revelation 20, they are relegated to hell because their name has not been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So before Christ, people went to a temporary place. But once Christ was resurrected and go to heaven, then people started going there to heaven once uh, they died, if they believed in the Messiah. Or they went to a temporary place. So it's a, it's, it's a two-hour Bible study that most of you missed because we had a big storm that night. But it's a great study to find out where everybody goes when they die. So you'll know for sure where you go when you die. Jesus is the only way. We just quoted John 14, 6. Acts 4, 12. There is no other name under heaven by which men shall be saved except for Jesus Christ. That's what Acts 4, 12 says. No other name under heaven. Only Jesus and then Romans 3. I want to take you over to Romans 3. There's a lot in here, but for now, I just want to read a few of the verses. We're going to get to some of the others in a minute. This is Romans 3, 24 to... Tw uh, let's, yeah, let's start with 24. Uh, it says that we have been justified, means just as if I'd never sinned, as a gift... In other words, God gives it to us as a gift. We don't pay anything for it. He's paid the penalty for it. By his grace, it's his grace that gives us this gift and justifies it through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus is the redeemer paid the price. That's what redemption is, is paying the price. So God makes it for us just as if we'd not sinned. And he does it 
by his grace, he does it as a gift, and he does it through the redemption that comes through Jesus Christ, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith, it says in verse 25. So for those who believe, that lays out right there that the only way we can be redeemed from our sins is through Jesus Christ. That's the only way. Through the Messiah that was prophesied way back in Genesis 3.15 and proven to be Jesus Christ. That's the only way we can get to heaven with God. So now, why do we need a redeemer? That's the question people say. Well, I'm a good person. I do good things. I'm not a Satanist. I don't, I don't get even with people. Uh, I like to help people. I do good social justice kinds of good works. I'm, I'm going to go to heaven. I mean, why wouldn't I? You look at the balance scale, and I do so many more good things than I do bad. Is that, gonna get, that attitude going to get us to heaven? No. We're going to walk through what I call, what I don't call, somebody else called it this, the Romans Road. So you can know it, you can have it, you can see it. Because it's a great way to share the gospel, but it's also something important for us to walk through tonight. And it starts with Romans 1.16. Now, Romans 1.16 starts a little differently. I mean, it adds a little bit more. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. That's the first thing. Are you ashamed of Jesus Christ? Are you ashamed of what he did, did for us? You know, some people are ashamed because they see Jesus as weak. Well, he wasn't weak. To go from being God to giving up your life, that's not weak. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Okay, so are you saying that if I believe in my head that Jesus died and was buried and rose again from the dead, because that's the gospel message, if I believe that with my head, that's my way to salvation? No, but it's a start. Because it's, it, 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 you know, you got to realize it in your head before you move on to your heart. But that's not going to save you, just realizing that the gospel message is there. But the power of God, when you believe that, will draw you to himself. So it's the power. The gospel is the power of God for salvation. Nothing else has the power of salvation except the gospel message through Jesus Christ's redemption. Nothing else can save you. That's what it means by the power of God. And then chapter 2, in verse 4, talks about our need for repentance. Is that what I said there? Yeah, needs to repent. In verse 4, it says, do, you, do not think lightly of the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance. So it's God that draws us to himself. I read recently a statement by Adrian Rogers who is a, a former pastor who's passed away, and I will probably butcher this, but I love the way he explained it. Let's look at Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. A familiar passage to many of you. It says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it's a gift of God, not as a result of works that no man should boast. Okay, let's start over now that you've heard it. For by grace you have been saved. Okay, God's grace. What is God's grace? God's grace is a merit of favor. Well, God's grace goes out to everybody. But not everybody's saved. So it says, for by grace you've been saved. But then there's something else. Through what? Faith. But wait a minute. If my faith saves me, then I have something to do with my salvation. But I have nothing to do with my salvation because it's all God's grace. So there's a little oxymoron here trying to build up with, among itself. For by grace you've been saved through faith. But then it says it's not of yourself, it's a gift of God. So you don't have anything to do with it. But you do because you have to have faith. So you're getting a little confusing here. It's, not a, it's a gift of God, not that any man should boast. It's not by our works so that we won't boast. So here's how Adrian Rogers describes that. He said, God's grace, because of God's love for us, he reaches down to a sinful mankind an unredeemable mankind and because of his grace he redeems us because of his love for us through his grace he redeems mankind so it's like for lack of a better thing i think of the sistine chapel where god and adam are touching but it's like god reaching down because of his love for us and his grace he's reaching down to every one of us 
While we are down here looking up, we're sinners. We don't have anything to offer. But through our sinfulness, we can have faith in God's grace and his mercy and his love and what he's done for us. So in, by our repentance, we can reach up to God. And that's when grace meets faith. And I, I like that explanation. So God's hand reaching down in love and grace, trying to woo us to come to him. But it takes our faith, because we're sinners, to believe in what God does. And so we reach out and grab God's hand, and that's salvation. Now, it's probably did not do a good justice to Adrian Rogers and how he explained it. But I like that, because it makes sense to me. Because our salvation is not about us. It's about God. But it is about us. We have to have faith. So that explains it to me. Um, where was I? So that's repentance. See, faith, with faith is repentance. What is repentance? What does it mean to repent? What, Jenny? Turn around. Okay, turn around. Go the opposite direction from where you were going. Give up your sin and go in a different direction. So in this case, when we're talking about repentance for salvation, we're talking about walking the way of the world because that's all we know. And then God reaches out in his grace and we repent and we turn around and we go in an opposite direction. Now tell me, can I go that way and that way at the same time? I can't. That's impossible. I can't walk forward and backwards at the same time. I can't go left and right at the same time. You can only go one way. You either go the way of the world or you go the way of God. You either go the way of the world or you repent and you turn to God. So that's the second aspect of why we need a redeemer. We need repentance. But the main thing is number three, Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every one of us has sinned. As a matter of fact, in 1 John 1, it says if you say you have no sin, you've sinned already. <laughs> because you said you'd have no sin. My father said that to me one time. He's a great man, wonderful man. I mean, he just didn't do anything wrong in his lifetime. So he said to me one time, when we were talking about something, he said, well, I don't sin. I said, you just did by saying you don't sin. And then I quoted the verse to him. Uh, and I said, well, the fact of the matter is, Pop, you do sin. I said, you know, you know, if you've been around somebody who's in control all their lives and then all of a sudden they're not, it's really tough on them. And once in a while he got a little short with the nurses and stuff. And I said, when you yelled at the nurse the other day, that was a sin. Well, she wasn't doing what she was supposed to do. I said, I understand that, Pop, but it was still a sin. But he, I mean, he didn't, he didn't think he sinned because he was really a good man. But the Bible says all of us have sinned. And where did that sin come from? Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. We are born into sin. You can read Romans 5. Fascinating to read about Adam's sin versus Christ's redemption in Romans chapter 5. But all of us have sinned. And if we've all sinned, can any sin enter heaven? No, not one little white lie, not one little itty bitty pin drop of sin can enter heaven. So that means something has to take care of our sin. Now, if you're a Catholic, or as I was raised a Catholic, uh, I was told that if I went and confessed my sins to a priest, they'd all be wiped clean, and I would go to heaven. But I can't remember one time when I went and made confession that I got rid of all my sins, because a lot of times I don't know my sins. Even now I don't know my sins. God has to reveal them to me, which he's very gracious to do. Just pray Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. Search me, O Lord, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any hurtful way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. He's really good about doing that. And I'm glad he is. The point being is there's nothing that anybody can do on this earth that can take our sins away. There's only one way our sins can be redeemed, and that's through our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Romans 6, 23. Oops, Romans 5, 8. God, when we're still sinners, God demonstrates his own love for us in that while we were yet sinners, what did Christ do? He died for us. I mean, the Bible talks about how many people will die for, for um, your family, let alone sinners. Jesus died for sinners when yet not one of us had turned to him. And yet he died for us because he loves us that much. That's redemption through Jesus Christ. Christ died for us to pay the penalty for our sin. 
Number five, the wages of sin is death. Well, we know that. The wages of sin is death. You have no alternative if you're in your sin except to die physically and spiritually. Spiritually, it's called the second death. And those people in Revelation 20 will go into the lake of fire, eternal hell. Gehenna, it's called in the Bible. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God. And we've seen that word free several times. This is a free gift, folks. You can't buy it. You can't manipulate it. You can't pretend. You can't uh, do something on your outward experience. You can't do good works to get it. It's a free gift of God. So while our wages are death, God gives us a free gift, and that's eternal life. But it only comes one way. What is that? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. So what do you do? You say, okay, well, I know I'm a sinner. I believe Jesus redeemed me. I believe he's God. I believe he's the, on the fulfillment of prophecy. I believe he's the only way that my sins could be paid for by his blood. So what do I do? Romans 10. And that says that 9 and 13, but it should say 9, 10 and 13. Romans 10 says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Now, you might say, well, there's a lot of the gospel message just left out of this little statement. But if you confess with your mouth, you're saying it out loud. You're telling other people that you believe Jesus is the Lord of your life. You've made him Lord of your life. What does it mean to be Lord of your life? What? Be controlled by him. A Lord, a master, is somebody who tells you what to do, who guides you in everything, who takes care of everything in your life, and you're his servant, his doulos, his, and he's your master. That's what a Lord is. So if Jesus is our Lord, then we recognize him not only as God and our Redeemer, but we surrender to him to follow him all of our lives. We, in effect, become his servants or his slaves. And I don't like to use those words because they're, they're negative words for us. But that's what it amounts to. We have totally surrendered all of our rights to Jesus Christ when we make him Lord. And it's not just this little platitude, oh, yeah, Jesus, you're my Lord. This is a complete surrender of our lives to him. So we, it says, confess with your mouth, Jesus says, Lord. Okay, I've confessed that. Jesus is my all. I will follow him. And then it says, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. It doesn't say believe in your heart that God died for your sins and that he was your redeemer. It says believe that he raised him from the dead. Why? Why does it say that? <coughs> well, generally, if you believe in the raising from the dead, you've already believed that he's died for you and your sins on the cross. You're believing the gospel message, and it's using here just the raising of the dead for the gospel message. Bob? That's right. He said you could be 18 inches away from salvation, knowing it in your head versus having it in your heart. So you can confess Jesus as Lord with your mouth, but it has to be a heart decision. You have to surrender with your heart. So it says, uh, confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. Verse 10. For with the heart man believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. Believes, the, he, the Greek word for believes is pistis. Actually, this is a verb, so it's pisteo. So it says here, our heart. Now, we have to believe. Believe and faith are the same word throughout the New Testament. Pisteo is a verb. And it doesn't mean just simply, I believe with my head. But you have to also believe in your heart. And that means that, yes, I acknowledge, I recognize mentally. I know who Jesus Christ is. He's God, he's my Savior, he's my Redeemer. That's the first part. But then we have to surrender with our hearts. That's the second part. That's the moment of salvation. When you have reached up to God in faith and grabbed his hand of grace. That's your salvation. Because you, and I'm using our terms, not God's terms. But that's the moment when faith says, I am unworthy to enter heaven. I'm a sinner. I need help. And God is my help. And that comes from your heart when you surrender to Christ's lordship. And then the, the final aspect of faith is conduct, which once you get saved, there's an automatic desire to do God's work. Now, you don't get up the next morning and say, oh, I'm joining this church and I'm going to get involved in this ministry and do all this. But the day after I got saved, I got up and I knew I was different. And all of a sudden, I wanted to get a Bible and I wanted to get to know God and I wanted to go to a church and 
because I knew I couldn't go back to my church. And there were things that started growing inside of me. And I didn't have to work towards them. They were just automatic because the Holy Spirit now filled my heart. And he was leading me in these new directions. So verse 13 says in Romans 10, whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And once we're saved, according to Ephesians 2.10, after the Ephesians 2.8 and 9, that we're saved by grace, 2.10 says that we are created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So God wants us to do good works, but it's an outgrowth of our love for Christ that we do them, not just because we live on this earth and we're nice people. That is the salvation message. Well, what about you? Do you know Christ? Do you need Christ? Will you surrender to Christ as your Lord and Savior? Have you done that before? Are you sure you've done it before? Because the moment your spirit goes out of your body, you're going to heaven or you're going to hell. There's no other second chances. And you know, you've got to know now where you're going. The Bible is clear. I've got oodles of other verses I could share with you, but I think you get the picture of everything we've talked about tonight. God gave us a plan of redemption. That plan is through Jesus Christ. It's God's gift to us, but we have to recognize we're sinners and reach out in faith to take God's grace. Let's pray. Father, what a powerful message tonight as we walk through Jesus Christ and what he did for us. His redeeming grace because he loves us so much that he gave of himself that we might have eternal life with you. The only way we can have it is through Jesus. But we can have it through Jesus. And it's so simple. It's so easy. We make it so hard. But all it is is a heart transformation of surrendering to who Jesus Christ is, what he's done for us, giving our lives. So I'm going to give everybody the opportunity today to pray that prayer. If God is leading you, I don't want to manipulate you. You're not doing it for me. You're doing it if you do it because you desire to know for sure that you will spend eternity with God. And that's your heart and that's what you want to do. So if you do, you just pray a prayer with me right now and say, Heavenly Father, I thank you that you love me so much that when I'm still a sinner, you sent Christ to die for my sins. And Jesus Christ as God did die for those sins. He made provision through his blood, through his death, and then through his resurrection to conquer death. He overcame all sin from, for everyone, for all eternity. But I need to accept my responsibility. I need to repent and realize that I need a Savior, that I can't get to heaven without someone paying the price for me, and that price was paid by Jesus Christ. So in faith, I reach out to you and your grace, God, and through your love. And I say, I want to surrender my life to Jesus Christ. I want him to be Lord of my life, and I want to do everything he calls me to do. I'm yours, God. You're my Lord. Whatever you choose to do, I'm here. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. But close your eyes again. Because for those of us who've already made that prayer, in my case, it was 44 years ago, actually 44 years ago next week, that I prayed that prayer that made a distinction between my eternity in hell and my eternity with God. I didn't do it because I was afraid to die. I was too young to know the difference. But I made the commitment because I knew that I couldn't live my life without God. But God, in the 44 years, it's tough. Life gets in the way. We go forward. We go backwards. Whether they say three steps forward, two steps back. Life gets tough. And, and we need to continue to remember that you are our Lord. When the honeymoon's over, that relationship doesn't end. It just keeps going on. As a matter of fact, you justified us with our salvation. But you sanctify us in salvation, which is you want us to walk in that salvation every day of our lives. And as I started out talking about Billy Graham, I'll end up talking about him because that man, uh, though he made some mistakes, we all do. They weren't uh, major ones, but he made mistakes. But that man was faithful all the days of his life until he died at 99. All the days of his life of serving you. Father, I don't want to be like Billy Graham because I'm not, and I can't ever be. But I want to be a good and faithful servant. And I want to serve you all the days of my life. And so right now, individually in this room, if you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, are you willing to recommit to him? Are you willing to say to him, Oh God, sometimes I let the world get in the way, but I want to follow you with all my heart. 
I recommit myself to you right now because I want you to be Lord. I want to follow you. I don't want to do anything ahead of you. I don't want to do anything that sins against you or disobeys you. I want to do what you want me to do. So you lead and guide me each and every step of the way, and I will follow you. And these things I pray and commit to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. So now you have something to think about. I want to end with the fact that Jesus is coming again. The hope of our redemption is that we're going to spend eternity with him. He's coming again to take us in the rapture, to be with him forever. Or if we die beforehand, he will meet us and take us to heaven so we'll be with him forever. He's going to physically return to this earth where he will reign on the earth as king of kings and lord of lords, no longer the suffering servant. And then the time will come when he will establish his kingdom on earth and then all eternity after that thousand years is up. And guess who's going to be with him? We are, if we have believed, surrendered our lives to Jesus Christ. He's going to come like this someday, maybe someday soon, coming in the clouds to receive us unto himself. Will you be going up with him? That's the most important question you can ever ask. Thank you for joining us today on Living Word Ministries with Debbie Blank. Living Word Ministries is a listener-supported program. To contact Debbie Blank, you may do so at livingwordministry.org. That's www.livingwordministry.org. Please tune in each week at the same time for Living Word Ministries with Debbie Blank.